Um, so hello everyone, my name is Robert Underwood, if you don't know who I am. So we're going to be talking about a introduction to Python, calling it a parser term primar primarily because I couldn't think of anything else better to do on short notice. So kind of coming up, we're going to be talking about getting into the zen of Python. Python is a very opinionated language. Um, you are kind of expected to do things a certain way, and if you don't do them that way, one, people will look at your code and say that's disgusting, but two, they will also potentially have problems with performance with your code, because certain code paths are optimized in Python based around what is, quote unquote, a Pythonic way to do things. So that is kind of an important thing that we'll talk about. We'll talk about um, imperative programming, and we're gonna kind of look at that through the example of a number guessing game. Um, then we're gonna look at functional programming, which is kind of a variety of math tricks, but for um, Spark, MapReduce, which is kind of the goal of this presentation, um, functional programming techniques are going to be very important. Um, we'll then briefly look into string parsing and text processing. Um, a very deep introduction, a very brief introduction into object-oriented programming, and then we're gonna round it out with talking about where you can find other resources that could potentially be useful. So without that, without further ado, let's get into the Zen of Python. So getting started. So what version of Python? This actually matters. There are two stable versions of Python that are currently released. 3.43. There's 3.43, or 3.5 is actually the latest version. Um, it's not available on older versions of Ubuntu yet, <coughs> but 3.5 is the latest release as of the time of this presentation. Um, and then there's also 2.7. Um, there were some major changes in the language between those two versions. Um, the version that he provided in class is 2.7. Um, however, it is pretty trivial to switch it over to Python 3. I would recommend doing that. Um, there are enough things in Python 3 specifically with regards to functional programming that will be helpful in doing the project <coughs> that I would recommend and I can provide the kernel.json file that you will need to do that after we finish the presentation. Um, additionally, unlike, kind of like how C has multiple compilers with GCC and Clang, um, there are also multiple interpreters for Python. The most common interpreter that you will see is the kind of the C Python interpretation of that called Cython. Um, it is generally the executable called Python on your system. However, there are other ones. Um, Palmetto uses a version of the Python interpreter called Anaconda, um, which is a proprietary version of Python. It allegedly has better performance characteristics than the traditional Python interpreter really. for data science applications. Um, does it really, though? Who knows? So IPython specifically provides kind of an ease of use wrapper around the default Python shell. You can configure it to use other Python backends, like for example on Palmetto, it's configured to use the Anaconda Python interpreter, but primarily it's just an ease of use layer that kind of wraps your Python interpreter. Um, and then additionally, um, things that you kind of want to be able to know about is installing modules via pip. So Python comes with its own package management system for installing useful utilities or extra classes to extend the functionality of the base library. We'll talk about that more in a little bit, but the basic big picture is <coughs> it exists as a thing and is useful. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about the Zen of Python. So Python is meant to be a beautiful language. Um, so is that actual code? Yes, that is. Um, so in Python, if you type import this, you will get this wonderful little poem by Tim Peters, who is one of the maintainers for Python. This kind of poem here summarizes some of the major design principles behind Python. Um, some of the ones that I want to kind of key in here exactly are beautiful is better than ugly. So things that are ugly are like collections of braces and curly bars, or having to do, um, having to typecast your iterators if you, for people that are familiar with C++. Um, basically, there's a lot of pain and suffering that is involved with 
using other languages. And Python tries to, as much as possible, either hide the disgustingness that is that, or if they can't completely hide it, make it as pain-free as possible. Um, so good Python code should be elegant. Um, it's going to be short. It's going to be expressive. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that when we get into how exactly you do it. The other kind of major idea here is simple is better than complex. This means that when you're thinking about a problem in Python, the simplest answer is usually the one that is the most performant. Like if you find yourself like reaching for um, bizarro lambda functions, chances are you can probably just get it done with one of the methods on the class already. Um, a lot of the functionality is provided out of the box which kind of all summarizes in the statement, there should be exactly one obvious way to do something. You shouldn't have to think, oh, well, if I'm doing this, I should probably do it this way. It should be, in Python, they try as much as possible to be, have one very obvious way for doing a thing. <coughs> so that is kind of what I meant to say with regards to like big picture, how to think about or how to approach Python programming. Let's go on to actual imperative programming. So imperative programming is the paradigm that you are probably most familiar with. It's what C uses, it's what Java uses. Kind of, well, Java's a mix of imperative and object-oriented. But <coughs> imperative program, basically think about it, you have a list of statements, you go down the statements and do the things that are in the statements. You follow a series of imperatives. <laughs> um, so things that are important in imperative languages are things like variables. So in Python, you use duct typing. So duct typing is kind of a weird expression, but basically what it means is if it quacks like a duck, it's a duck. Um, so instead of looking for a specific type on a variable, it looks, on, looks for methods that are associated with a given type. So type, <laughs> um, would it be correct to say it's typecasting is either not a thing or harder to do? So typecasting is actually very easy in Python, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But the way that you think about these kinds of things is instead of like explicitly typing a variable, you just try to make sure that a particular function has certain meta methods. And if it doesn't have those methods, then you throw an exception. Um, but that's basically the big idea. Um, there are several types of immutable variable types. These are variables that um, you can't really create aliases with. <laughs> so if you modify them and assign it to another thing, you're fine. You don't have any aliasing problems with the mutable data types. The downside to this is that these data types will cost memory every time you reassign them or change them, um, even if only for a short time. Um, these types include none. This is the equivalent of null in any other language that you're probably familiar with. I mean, it's subtly different, but in principle, it's the same. Could you we didn't like, find anything. Um, would you be able to like actually write like something like none variable name and then <laughs> like some amount of like hand it some data and assign it to that? Um, is that like a thing you could do? Because like in like C or C++, you can't really. So you could say like A equals none. And then you could look at the type of A, and you'll see that it's a none type. Um, but then you could then you could also do like A equals two. Well, they do actually. Yeah, you don't think of them as types. Um, it basically boils down to is you have one of these seven types of immutable things as your basic type that you're going to worry about on a regular basis. There are some additional ones that I'm not mentioning here, but like big picture. These are the types that exist. Um, floats are floating point numbers. Ints are integers. I believe the floats are a 64-bit IEEE floating point number. Um, ints are arbitrary precision integers. There's no such thing as an unsigned int in Python. And it's arbitrary precision. That means that you can have a 128-digit number in Python, and Python doesn't care. Um, you could have a 400 digit number in Python. Python doesn't care. It may take a little bit longer to work with that number, but like in terms of like actually doing something with it, it doesn't care. Um, you're not gonna 
run into overflow issues or underflow issues. It just takes care, the language itself takes care of it. Um, you also have native support for complex numbers. Um, not that you're going to need those on the project. Um, strings are a base type. There is no such thing as a character. Okay? All you have is strings. So if you have a string of length one, that's like the character that you're used to. And strings have several methods associated with them. Um, then there are two weird ones. There are tuples and functions. So if you've ever used JavaScript before, you'll know that JavaScript has functions as first class objects, which means that you can do assignments on functions, you can pass functions as variables, all of the things that you normally do with variables you can do to functions. And that's exactly true here. So like you can have a list of functions, for example, or a dictionary of functions. Um, and it just functions works. Out functions. <laughs> yeah. So for example, it's not an uncommon practice in Python to have a function which takes a function as an argument. Um, so big picture, keep that in mind. Now there's two things that I want to try to draw a difference between. You have a tuple and you have a list. The only major difference between them is lists are mutable, which means there are aliasing problems associated with them. And you don't create a new one every time you change it. Whereas tuples are not. Tuples are immutable. But they basically fill the same purpose. They are a ordered collection of things. So the order that you insert into them matters, and it kind of encodes some sort of sequence. <laughs> um, one thing to note about tuples and lists, though, is that tuples and lists can have any arbitrary types as elements. So you can have like a list that has more than one type of? Yes, so you can have like a list well, of. Not really more than one type. But no, no, actually more than one type. So like you can have a list that has an integer followed by a function, followed by a none type, followed by a float, so like followed a by another integer. General list of objects. <laughs> it's just a generic list of objects. Um, you as the programmer provide any additional meaning that may be there. Um, but big picture, Python doesn't care. So Python <laughs> is kind of like actually writing on paper in that um, you're actually you're just putting a bunch of graphite on some like dead trees, and that all the meaning from it actually comes from the program. Yeah, from the semantics of the program itself. Um, additionally, you have two mutable types, and if you're not using these, you're probably using Python incorrectly. Um, those are dictionaries and lists. So dictionaries, think those are your array replacements, or, or excuse me, lists are your array replacements. Dictionaries are an arbitrary um, associative array. Does that mean that they don't have order? Or they, they don't necessarily have order. They could have order? Yeah, So, and we'll get to that in a minute. But big picture, you have unordered, basically they are unordered associative arrays. Um, so that means they have a key and a value. So given from what I've told you about lists, do you think that the keys have to all be of the same type? Nope. They don't. In fact, you can have integer keys and string keys it might be less in the same array. The you same probably way. want to, for the sake of sanity, keep them as one type, but like Python, the language strictly does not require you to make all of your keys of the same type. Likewise, your values could all be of different types, too. The one kind of gotcha is you can only have one value for any given key. So if you want to have, like, for example, a C++ multiset or a C++ multimap, um, you're going to have to, where you could can have you multiple same valued keys. The way that you would represent that in Python is you would have a list, a dictionary of lists, where each element in the list corresponds to an can entry in the set. Can the data that goes with the key in a dictionary be another dictionary? Yes, it can. It can also be a list, it can be a tuple, it can even be functions. Um, in fact, since Python doesn't have a switch case statement, the way that you typically implement which case-like functionality is through a dictionary of function pointers. Um, so big picture, those are variables. Let's focus in on what we call container types for just a minute here. So container types, um, we have dictionaries, which kind of map keys to values. Sets are basically the same thing as dictionaries, except for there's no values associated with them. That, now, notice that is not to say that it is the same as a dictionary that maps to none. 
Those are actually different things. Um, so that does matter. Um, sets are a mutable set of keys. Lists are a mutable ordered list. Tuples we explained earlier. There's also a module in Python called collections. This module provides various other things that you might find useful. For example, um, dex, double-ended queues. Um, uh, name tuples is another commonly used one. Um, but they kind of provide additional types of containers that may be useful for you. Um, if you want to know more about that, I recommend reading up the documentation on the collections module. <laughs> so what is true? Short answer, if it's zero, false, or none, it's false. Everything else is true. That includes the empty string, or an empty dictionary, or an empty list. Okay? So, Keep that in mind when you're trying to do comparisons with things. <laughs> it seems like it, those things should be false, though. Yeah, because they are actually things. But just be aware that's something that you will need to know. So conditional statements, they work pretty much how you expect. Um, the operators for comparisons are basically the same ones that are used in C++. And as far as I'm aware, Java uses most of the same ones. Um, so you, the one difference is the logical operators have changed. Uh, so for example, instead of ampersand ampersand to represent and, it's just the word and. If you want an or, it's just the word or. Um, one interesting note on the case of or is if you do like x equals none or three, or none or four, what do you think that's going to evaluate to? <laughs> what? Well, it's going to evaluate to true, but what value gets stored in x? Uh, is it a Boolean true or is it something else? Uh, that's a it's actually going to be the value four. Uh, so the none so kind of gets over in because so something and we something. Yeah, so we evaluate to the reference of the thing which evaluates true. Or the first reference of the thing that evaluates true. Likewise, if we have x equals 4 and none, <coughs> that's going to evaluate to none. <coughs> Does that make sense? Is this so false capitalized? False is capitalized as is true. We'll talk more about that in a second. But the big idea here is there's a common idiom of if you want to provide a default and you don't have and you have enough defaults that are it's a small list and it doesn't make sense to like store them in a dictionary or something like that. There's kind of this idiom of saying none or the default or, or your the value that you're passing in or the default. So just kind of be aware that that's a thing. Lsift is renamed. E L I F. Um, you can also kind of do tests for like containment and sets. For example, x in 3, 4, or 5 will return true if x equals 3, 4, or 5, kind of how you'd expect. You can also do the same things for keys in a dictionary. Um, so if there's the key 3 in the dictionary and x is equal to 3, that will return true. <coughs> um, so just kind of things to be aware of. Else works as you expect. Notice there's no curly braces in Python. So the way that you keep track of code blocks is via indentation. So it's recommended according to PEP8, which is the style guide that Python programmers follow, you use four spaces. Or How, tab. Or, however, the language allows you to use either four spaces or a tab. Personally, um, you will run into fewer problems using four spaces, but you shouldn't run into the problems if people configure their editors correctly. However, people generally fail at doing that. So, so four if spaces. You need to, like do two indents though, then, you're, like, then you use tab. Yes, that's correct. And then what if you what if you get into like some ridiculous amount of indentations? Well, you shouldn't, because simple is better than complex. So if you're getting into ridiculous amounts of comp of indentation, you've probably Messed up, messed in up a in, in a different way. 
Um, so you try to do things flat instead of nested. Um, and when you need to do things in a nested fashion, Python has ways of making that less painful. Um, but just be aware that that's a thing. Um, and else works kind of how you would expect. Um, this is also probably a good time to introduce the print function. So print is how you send things to standard out in Python. It accepts a list of arguments. Um, so for example here, I passed foo comma x. This will print foo and x separated by a single space and ending with a new line character. Um, you can actually override the new line can character by setting the end variable in print to false, or in, no, the end variable to um, the empty string, but more on that in a minute. But basically, big idea is print allows you to send things to standard out. Um, looping is likewise similar, simple in Python. Um, so you'll see here that I have for A in range 1 to 10 um, by increments of 2. So what this is going to do is it's going to start with the value 1, increment by 2, until it gets to the range 10. Now, this is probably where you're going to run into the most breaking of idioms of anything from a person coming from any other language to Python. So Python allows you to loop over arbitrary objects. Okay. So for example, if you have a list of objects and you say for thing in list, this arbitrary list of objects, inside the loop, thing will have the value of whatever that list is. Um, so that's a very useful feature. So that means that you don't have to do for i in range this and then a of i if a is your range or the collection that you're looping over. Just do for i in range or for i in thing instead of for i in range and then. So if you ever see that in your code, something Should to avoid. Should the else be indented? The else in the print? No, it's not indented. And here's why. So in Python, you can have else statements on loops. Okay. It's kind of a weird thing to think about at first, but it does actually have a use case. So for example, here, we're looking for the number five. So if we encounter the number five, we're going to issue a break statement. Um, you may have been around, you may remember from like CS 101, 102, breaking is bad. Breaking is not bad in Python. So what we've done here is else we'll get called only if we didn't get a break. So if we do not call break anywhere in this code block, then else will get called. So for example, it's good if we're like looking through a list for some reason, and we need to, and we want to break out early after we found it, we can use the else statement to say that we never found anything. Okay. Um, would, it, would it also be okay though to have it indented, have the else indented, then have like some, like set, like some other variable to true, and then at, at, the, at the outside also do like an if statement to say like <laughs> if equals true, then so that. would that have the same? It would have the same semantic meaning. However, this is the more Pythonic way oh, of doing think, it, yeah. and the language is optimized for this type of behavior, not the behavior that you're talking about. I know. So, just be aware that else exists as a statement on loops. Um, here's a brief introduction to lists. So you can make a list literal. For example, here I've made a list containing the numbers one through five. Then I've appended zero. So what that's gonna do is gonna add zero to the end of the list. So on lists, append is fast, but insert is not. Insert can be up to linear time. Append will always take constant time. <laughs> So what that means is that if you want to insert at the beginning, you're going to be looking at using a deck. The double and do queue from the collections module I talked about earlier. So um, the find function that we talked about earlier, that has basically been replaced by index. So index will return the index of the value 3. So in this case, it will return the value 2 into position. Wait, because wait. zero, one, two. Wouldn't does the zero not go to the very end though? Zero goes to the end, but we're, when we're looking for the in, when we say a dot index of three, 
it's going to look for the first three in the sequence and return the position of that three. Okay. Oh, so oh, okay, okay. When you said two, yeah. Um, I thought you meant like that two from the top. So I'm like, wait, but that two is in the second. Okay. Okay. So you know how we talked about things have don't have sorted order. This is how you make them have sorted order. Um, so sorted takes an arbitrary iterator. So anything that's a sequence type, a dictionary, a list, a set, um, and returns it in sorted order. <laughs> is it um, so, as in order that it was put into or order of like? Order of the values. So in this case, this code will print 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Okay? Even though we inserted 0 later in the code. Or between the assignment and actually printing it. Um, if you want to change the ordering that something is sorted, um, there's actually something called a key function. So let's take a look at that real quick. <coughs> so you can say a equals 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And then we can say sorted of a key we could say, for example, reversed <laughs> equals true. Let's get a list out of that. <laughs> yeah. We could do that. Additionally, we could also just do reversed of A, which will return them in backwards order. Uh, you could also potentially um, sort these by other means. So you could put a key function in that will sort on, for example, um, let's say the length, let's say we had a list of strings. So A equals um, ABC, ASDF, and five letter thing and then a single character and then a two character thing. <laughs> so that's a list. So what do you think <coughs> this does? Link. <coughs> it's going to sort the strings by their length. So if you want to change how something is sorted, you specify a key function that will then be passed to the default comparator to figure out how to sort something. <coughs> dictionaries. So dictionaries, again, work pretty much just as you expect. There is a curly bracket. What? There is a curly bracket. Yes. Curly brackets in Python mean dictionary or set. But here they mean dictionary. So. We see A corresponds to 1, B corresponds to 2, C corresponds to 3. <coughs> um, there is no difference between double quotes and single quotes in Python. There used to have been one, but there is no long longer a difference between them. Um, so what this will do right here is it'll look up the value A and then increase that value by 2, so then we would have 3, 2, 3 in the dictionary. Um, you can also just like insert something into a list like this with like a of key equals value. Um, what do you think that get function does? <coughs> Seems like that should return an error. Well, it would, except for the second parameter right here is the value that you want to return as a default. Is that really inserting it or just telling you that if asked for e, then? Ask for e. If e is not there, return zero in this case. Um, if you don't do that, so it's not really <laughs> inserting. No, it's not. The only kind of. So, for example, if we had like i squared for i in range ten, <coughs> and then we look at the value b, we have this set here. <coughs> Actually, let's make that a map. So if we look at the value b, what we can actually do here is we can actually do 
we if we try to look for say the value 10 so we do b of 10 it's going to raise an exception called a key error so if we wanted to handle that we could say try <coughs> b of 10 <coughs> except key error and then we could say print we caught the exception <coughs> and then we'll see that we caught the exception <coughs> more on that in a little bit how did you type um, to do more than one line on the line you just hit enter it knows by the fact that you have a colon at the end that it's going to need a code block to follow it uh, additionally you can loop through keys so like for example this code right here will look for all of the keys in the dictionary a and then it's going to print the actually that should be key um, this will print the entire dictionary a followed by the value corresponding to the <laughs> ith key I par pardon my typo this should actually be print of key comma a of key does that make sense <coughs> Functions. Functions also work basically how you expect. Um, there are a couple nuances though. <coughs> so, this is called a doc string. Thou shalt write doc strings. Doc strings are basically a form of documentation for a specific function. Um, this one is perhaps a little trivial, but for more complicated functions, you should describe what the function does, perhaps what kind of values you're expecting to be passed into the function, things of that nature. You can then have any arbitrary code block. As long as the code is indented, it'll be considered part of the function. So now let's talk about these specific functions right here, these four, these five calls, excuse me, to the function add. What do you think these do? <coughs> add on um, nothing. Just will return. So, so this first one's going to return 4 because we have the default value oh. of a and b for 0 and 4. What about the second one? Don't know. It's going to return 5. So the first argument, first value gets assigned to the first keyword argument. And it'll keep on doing that as long as you have them. For example, this one will return 2 because 1 gets assigned to a and 1 gets assigned to 2. What about add b equals 3? <coughs> it's going to return 3 because a was not assigned. So in Python, you can actually explicitly pass to a specific argument just by providing the name of the argument that you want to pass to. This can, so th this is a, a nice convenience thing because you don't have to necessarily specify any argument that can be specified by a keyword. But it also gives you the nice added benefit of um, allowing you to specify some arguments but not all of them, but it's also useful specifically in inheritance. Um, so the reason why this is useful in inheritance is if you have a keyword argument, it's not expected necessarily for the children, so you can have a new keyword argument in a child that's not necessarily in a parent, and as long as you handle it, you're fine. Um, this also allows you to get around things like, for example, the order of keywords expected from a parent to a child. Um, so it is a useful thing to have. Additionally, what did I say about Python and typing? What kind of typing do we have in Python? Automatic. Duck typing or automatic typing. So if we pass in a float, for example, 1.0 and 2, that's just going to convert to the float 3 and return the float 3. It'll implicitly cast 2 to a float and then return the appropriate result. <laughs> so that's about it for functions. Um, some other weird arguments that you can possibly have. So this function at all adds an arbitrary sequence. It takes two arguments, args and quargs, as it's affectionately called. So args is basically any additional arguments that were passed to a function, and quargs is the list of all keyword arguments passed to a function. Um, so in this function, what we're going to do is for each key in quargs, we're going to print the key and the value associated with it. And then we're going to print the sum of all of the arguments. So what do you think the following code is going to do? <coughs> is 
Is there like a, um, a, a term for like the size of a list? Yes. Is it len, L-E-N. So here it's going to return the sum of these values, which is 17. So the first one is going to return 17. Um, notice Python already has a built-in for computing the sum, called sum. It's rather convenient. So you should probably never implement this particular function because Python already has one. Um, there are also functions for, for example, finding all of the true values. Um, that's specifically called all. There's another one for um, finding various different things. So you can also, for example, pass keyword arguments. Even though we didn't specify them in the function prototype, we can still pass the parameters b and c because we accept a star star keyword arguments argument to our function. So that's about it for imperative programming. Moving on to functional programming. So iterators and generators. So generators are a type of iterator. Okay? Iterators are objects, as is everything else in Python. But they define two methods, iter and next. So iter returns a new iterator. Usually it will reset the iteration state inside the object to some particular value. Next returns the next item on an iterator. So then, why, pray tell, do we need something called generators? <laughs> well, the difference between an iterator and a generator is an iterator must instantiate all of the values, or must have instantiated all of the values that it will return if it's just a normal iterator. Like, for example, iterating over a list, we have to have memory for each of those things. However, if it's a generator, it only has to keep the current value and the way to get to the next one. Um, so the reason why this is useful is generators are much more memory efficient because we can just reuse the same object that we're putting the thing into over and over again and only keep the state that we need in order to figure out which one to go to next. So iterators and generators are very important. Um, so how can we use these? So you may have heard the expression lambda functions before. So lambda functions, they're definitely out of functional programming. If you've done any functional programming before, you've definitely seen lambda functions. Lambda functions come from lambda calculus, which are basically parameterized functions that you use to do various work. So what lambda functions allow you to do is basically define a function that takes in one or more arguments and do something that requires only a single statement and return that result. Um, you should, if you're, I, from what I, if you did the assignment anything like I did, I use lambdas all over the place in that. Because you have a lot of throwaway functions and writing all of the individual functions that just arrange key value pairs is kind of obnoxious. But with lambda expressions, it's much less painful. Um, you'll also see kind of things like here, for example, this map function. Map is actually a method provided by Python, and it does exactly what you think it does. It applies a method across an iterator. Um, most things that work on sequences in Python just accept arbitrary iterators. They don't necessarily need a list or anything of that sort. They can just kind of work on iterators. So what that means is that you can do stuff like this and kind of apply the result of a function to all of its children. Now this is actually considered slightly a bit of an anti-pattern in Python because of the next slide that we're going to be talking about. Okay? The last thing here is what's called a generator expression. So a generator expression is going to return a generator, so in other words that really memory efficient iterator that we talked about a minute ago, but it's going to do it on this range thing. So range is actually it's obfuscated, but it's basically a generator, and its performance characteristics are similar to generators. Um, but just be aware that C is an iterator of, which is also a generator. What does C do is, um, well, with the third generator, that may make basically a copy of X for the first 10 elements, but for each value, only you add one to it? No. So what this is going to do is it's going to look at the number, so, range, again, is an iterator, but it's an efficient iterator, kind of 
it's not exactly a generator, it's implemented differently in the source code, but it behaves a lot like a generator in that it only keeps one value in memory. So in other words, the last value that we visited and the way to get to the next value. So one at a time, it's going to return those values and it's gonna put those values into the value x. And then we're going to yield the value of x plus one each time we call next on the function. So we're not constructing an actual list in memory. We're only constructing this little generator, which is then returning the elements in our list. So we're kind of implicitly storing the entire list here instead of explicitly storing the list. Okay. So in the end, though, like when this is done, though, C will have been given each of those elements. Yes. Um, but again, C is not actually the value. C is a function pointer to the iterator. Okay. So if you try to say like C plus one, you're going to get a, probably going to get a, an attribute error because C does not define the addition property, or it's going to do something weird and unexpected. I'm pretty sure it just crashes though. So comprehensions. So if you've ever used Haskell before, and I think Lisp has this too, you have the idea of kind of a list comprehension. That would be this guy right here. So this one does exactly what you think it did, like you thought generator expressions does. It's going to construct a list where each value is i plus two, for whatever that means. And in this case, we're looking at the range from zero to nine, inclusive. So. There are other types of iterators though, or other types of comprehensions. There are set comprehensions, which will create a set object. So in other words, unique key values. So if there are any duplicates, those get dropped. There's a dictionary, which is going to do the same kind of thing, except for it has associated key value pairs. And then you have those generator expressions, which I talked about earlier. So it set seems like <laughs> borderlining on like the special case thing. Uh, it's not exactly though. And the is that like a really common thing to run into where like you make, you're like modifying uh, some, <laughs> list, uh, some other list or set and you know, so you get a lot of duplicate values. Let's say you want to find out what the, what the list of unique values are mm -hmm. in a list. How would you do that? Oh, I could see how this could be, especially like so you just call is used for like quickly writing something to <laughs> parse a database. I, you know, that, could, that could be very useful, yeah. Yeah, but here's the thing. So the constructor for set takes an arbitrary iterator. And guess what? All of those things, all of those collections support the iterator protocol. So what does that mean? You can find unique values in a object simply by calling set on that object. Hmm. <laughs> um, it's really useful actually. Yeah. So just an interesting thing to think about food for thought as we go along. I think I used one comprehension in the assignment, but just be aware that it is a thing. Um, also, uh, one quick note here. Python 2 only has list comprehensions. It does not have the other three types. So, we're, so for the <laughs> homework assignment we're preparing for, we really should just be using lists, or rather like practicing for <laughs> Right now we should focus mostly on lists. I'll provide you the kernel that you need to switch over to Python 3. Um, I think you will be happier in Python 3. For a couple of reasons, including one that we're gonna be talking about in just a minute when we get to string parsing. So, zip and map. These are built-ins. So what do you think zip does? Takes <laughs> the information and stores it in the zip file. So we have two lists, A and B. make that the range from 5 to 10. <coughs> so B equals 5 through 9. What do you think this is going to do? Put them together. It's going to put them together. So if we make that into a list, which we can do very simply like this, <coughs> it's going to take the first copy from each list and kind of store these things into a tuple. So zip is a particularly useful function. Uh, there are actually better ways to do it. In um, Python 3, zip returns and 
generator expression. Can, is it possible to write, um, In Python 2, it returns a list. Can you actually like uh, do zips or so like um, all the A's will be a key and all the B's will be a value? So there's a different way to do that. Okay. Um, but it is not zip. Uh, there's actually another method that we'll talk about in a minute that does that. Um, reduce is from the func tools package. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, some other things that are useful are partial and partial method. Um, so in Lambda Calculus, there's this idea of like a partial function. So basically, you filled in some of the values of the function, but not all of them. So you need to get it down to a function of one variable. So if you know those things, you can use partial and partial method in order to kind of wrap those functions. So partial method works on classes and class methods. Partial works on just normal functions. Um, how many of you have used uh, C++ with like operator overloading and function overloading? Single dispatch is the way that you kind of access that in Python. So for example, if, for example, if you need to handle sequence types differently than a individual value, or if you need to handle different types differently for some reason, um, and you absolutely have to split them, single dispatch is the way that you do that. Um, there's also something called the total ordering decorator. So what total ordering lets you do is if you define two of the comparators, equals and another one, it'll fill in the rest of them. <laughs> so you can do less than, greater than, less than or equal to, greater than or equal to, or not equal to. So total ordering is useful for saving, writing the same thing over and over again. Um, wait, this is the fun tools package. So there's one other method that I want to mention here. There's also a zip with longest. Zip with longest does the same thing with zip, except for if the iterators are of different lengths, it stops. Which can be handy. Um, so when we get down to here with iterators, there's actually some such a thing as an infinite iterator. So this is a generator expression which returns stuff forever. So you can combine infinite iterators with zip with longest in order to, for example, map processes to nodes or something like that. You just call cycle on your list of nodes and it'll just ABC, 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 and then you can map jobs. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. You do a zip with longest of the chain of those values, so on and so forth. The thing that you are mentioning is actually called group by. So group by will take <coughs> kind of a set of key value pairs and then turn them into a dictionary. Okay. Additionally, Python allows you to do stuff like this. <coughs> so we just cast zip to a dict. And then as if by magic, we have a dictionary. So anything that has tuples that are of length two, and you have an iterable list of them, or an iterable, iterable sequence of them, you can convert them to a dictionary. This is kind of a little handy trick that exists. So just be aware that iter tools is a thing. And if you ever find yourself needing some really random way of working with things together, iter tools is probably it. <laughs> Operator. So I'm only including operator because it was included in the code that was provided during class. Operator gives you functions that behave the same way as the operators that you're used to using. So like add does A plus B. It's probably the fastest Python class that was ever developed uh, because it literally just calls what you would expect uh, with a couple exceptions. Uh, but you don't need to worry about those. I didn't see any of those codes. Um, the reason why operator is useful is things like lambda expressions, where you may not necessarily be able to get a value the way that you'd expect. This, with the operator module, you can actually do a lot of very list style programming. So just be aware that it is a thing that exists. It's also useful in comprehensions. Now onto string parsing, the part that you've all been waiting for. <coughs> 
So string parsing. There are several types of strings in Python, or rather several types of string literals. Behind the scenes, all of these things are actually stored as Unicode strings, which means that you can have like Russian or Japanese characters in there and you don't have to worry about them blowing up your ASCII. Uh, so just kind of a useful thing to be aware of. Um, so a couple of these actually matter. So the R before a string means it's a raw string, which means that you should not interpret backslashes as escape characters. You want a literal backslash every time that you type a backslash. Single and double quoted strings will actually convert escape characters. <laughs> Most of the strings that you're going to be dealing with are going to behave like the first two. There's also the concept of a byte string, so if you want something that is explicitly not Unicode, like for example, writing data to a socket. I have a, um, or something. sorry, can you go back to the slide for a group by? <coughs> So, several types of strings. Byte strings, again, are going to be ASCII values. <coughs> so, unlike Java strings, which are practically useless and very annoying, Python strings give you practically every method that you could probably ever hope or dream for. Um, some of the more important ones would be split, which returns the first index of a string, uh, or tokenizes a string on a particular token, not on a regex. Key difference there between Java. Um, index returns the first index of a particular substring. Um, so you can pass it like ABC and look for the pattern of ABC. Uh, join is an interesting one. So that allows you to like insert a substring in between a list of strings or objects that can be converted to strings. So that's useful, for example, if you need to like say put spaces in between things or you have a list of words and you want to put spaces in between them, join is useful for that. Um, the plus operation for strings is overloaded to be concatenation, like it is in Java. The one thing I will warn you about, though, is that actually has quadratic behavior. So if you just concatenate to a string indefinitely, that's going to take quadratic time. It's better to build up a list of the things that you want to concatenate and then call join on them at the end with the empty string. Does that make sense? Um, that will actually get back down to linear time. Um, upper and lower return uppercase and lowercase. There's also like title case. If you need to make things like the titles of books or things like that, uh, start with an end width, allow you to find common prefixes or suffixes. Simple as cake. If you need something more powerful than that, you can use regular expressions. So regular expressions are found in the regular expression library in Python. They are mostly Perl compatible. There are a couple differences, though. Notably, the question mark curly brace syntax is absent. So in Perl, the question mark curly brace expressions let you execute arbitrary Perl code inside of a regex expression. Why on earth would someone want to do that? Don't ask me, but it's the thing that makes Perl regex actually terrain complete. So they're not just regular expressions. That said, though, you can actually, I believe, parse context the regex language, the things called regex in Python are actually capable of parsing up to things that are context free. Kind of strange, but it exists. It's useful when string doesn't quite cut it, but that said, for performance reasons, if you can do it with string, you probably should. <laughs> um, however, you should never use Python regex to parse HTML, and there's a reason for that. is because oh, I love that one. this is perfectly valid HTML. <laughs> um, yes, all of these things will basically make your HTML person want to cry. But that's actually perfectly legal and valid HTML. This is an example of why HTML is not a regular language. It's actually recursively enumeratable, which means you need to use a recursively enumeratable parser in order to work with it. So, the more you know. Back to our presentation. <laughs> uh, 
So the way that you deal with regex in Python is pretty simple. Basically, you compile the regex like so, and then you can just do a find iter to get an iterator to all of the matches. There's also versions that provide lists and other such things. So, useful thing to have. <coughs> if you need to access groups, you can just do match.group, which corresponds to these paren matches that exist within the code. Simple as pie. <coughs> um, there are also, and this is a very important thing, specifically for this project, is there are well-known parsers for certain languages, namely comma-separated values. You don't have to parse them by hand anymore, which means that 20,000 leagues under the sea won't want, make you want to cry. Okay? Oh, by the way, um, we actually thought of a really simple thing to do. Um, when we want to actually start finding the tags, we just look for <laughs> the end. You just look for the first and the last comma. Uh, and then grab this text in between them. You can do that, or you can, do, or you can search for that, because that would be the end of what it is. Uh, actually, that doesn't quite work, and there's a couple examples of that. Um, but anyway, Python actually has native CSV parsing. So all of those problems you have with Java not having native CSV parsing are gone. So you just use the CSV reader class, and you're done, like that. Wasn't that easy. There's also ones for XML. There's actually multiple parsers for XML, depending on exactly what you're trying to do with it. One for HTML and one for JSON. I can speak from personal experience. The CSV and the JSON ones are fantastic. Uh, the other two leave something to be desired. Namely, if you're using the HTML one, you should probably use something called Beautiful Soup, which is a Python module which is available, which basically takes the one that exists for HTML and makes it not suck. Same thing with XML, you should use the diffused XML because XML has security vulnerabilities and is in fact a broken language. It just does very silly things. Uh, as a point of reference, consider the billion last vulnerability. Enough said. <coughs> diffused XML tries to mitigate these kinds of vulnerabilities. We're now going to very briefly touch on object-oriented programming. So classes, Python has classes. The constructor for a class is called double underscore init double underscore. Um, that's just the name of the constructor for a class. Just keep that in mind. There's no such thing as private or protected. There's only non-public and mangled. So anything beginning with a single underscore is considered a non-public method. So non-public doesn't mean you can't use it, just that you should feel bad if you use it. Okay. This is kind of resolving around one of the kind of central tenets of Python, which is called the gentleman's agreement, which means that you don't really keep your doors locked. You just kind of trust the person who's walking around to know what they're doing. Um, if you need to control access to a class, you can do that, and we'll talk about that later, but the idiomatic way of doing it is just let the variables be public. <laughs> and then if you have a really good reason for example, a state table that can, needs to be handled very carefully, you can just indicate that it shouldn't be messed with by putting a single underscore in front of it. Um, double underscore is mangled names. These are useful for methods that you don't want to be subclassed. Um, more on that in a minute. Python is a non allows for non-cooperative multiple inheritance, which means that you can have you can inherit from multiple classes at the same time and they don't all necessarily have to inherit from things. <coughs> Which means that you need to take care of something called the method resolution order. If you ever have to deal with the method resolution order, there's a wonderful talk by a guy by the name of Raymond Haddington, I believe is how you pronounce his name, um, called Super is Considered Super. If you want to know about how this works, I recommend you watch his talk. It's about an hour long. But it really explains it very well. Two big takeaways from that, though, are children are called before their parents, and in, in the order in the class declaration breaks ties amongst evenly specified classes. Um, other things to be aware of, properties. So Python has things called properties. These are basically variables that are wrapped around by function calls. So anytime you access that value, it calls a function call. 
And anytime you set that value, it calls another function. It's like getters and setters, but no dot gets. It's great. You should use it anytime that you want to simplify code and not make it look like Java, but you need to still do things like ensuring data integrity or controlling access in a multi-threaded program, for example, through the use of locks. Properties are very slick. So if you find that you need something a little bit heavier and you reach for the thought of doing a getter or a setter, don't write a property instead. <laughs> Here's an example. So for example, on the square class, um, we take in, in the constructor a side length, but we want to be able to have people access the area. So we define a property called area, and then we just return side squared. But we also allow people set the side length by modifying the area. So if you say a equals 25, it'll take the square root of that and set that to be the side value. Now isn't that nice? So all of the three things are viable code. Even though we didn't necessarily Actually, this should be area equals 25. That's a typo. My apologies. Even though we didn't actually officially call a method. <coughs> the way that you do properties is the getter is decorated with at property, and then the setter would be decorated by the name of the method for the property, dot setter. There's also a dot deleter for deleting things and a dot inserter, I think, also. Uh, but if you need those, those are useful. Types of methods in Python. So generic methods that just exist in classes or regular methods, you also have a couple of different ones. Class methods. Class methods are used to provide alternative constructors. <laughs> like for example, thing.from timestamp is a function in the Python date time class which allows you to take a Unix timestamp like the ones in the CSV data that we have and convert that to a Python date time object, which is much more useful and supports things like date time ranges and sorting of dates. You know, all of the things that you're like, where was this all of my life? Just as an example, the way that you create one of these methods is you basically name it as you would normally and then you just put a at sign class method above it. That's it. Um, static methods are for conceptually related functionality. Um, they're pretty easy to use. Additionally, if you want to force someone to instantiate a method, like in a child class, you can use raise unimplemented error, and that's kind of the standards compliant way of saying, hey, you need to really implement this function. <laughs> now to go down the rabbit hole very briefly. So everything in Python is an object. And that object is basically a dictionary, which means that you can access that dictionary to get information about the class. There's also a Python module called inspect, which lets you do the same thing. <coughs> so you can basically do all sorts of crazy things involving functions, and all you have to do is just call dot inspect. But if you need like a special level of black magic, you can actually create a class of classes. And like define one of the classes to be <laughs> instead of like um, a dictionary of classes defined by some key. Don't think about it that way. So this is going to blow your mind, but just kind of hold on to it for a second. So there's a Python web framework called Django. In Django, there's a class called a model class. And when you create a variable in the module class, that corresponds to creating a column in a database in a SQL table. The way that they do that is with meta classes. As I said, it's black magic. But you should probably be aware that it is a thing. So in the weird case that you find yourself needing it, you know where to look. Additionally, there are things called magic methods. Um, would, these would are meta classes kind of <laughs> be like instead of overloading function, it'd be like overloading everything a function inside of a function, kind of. So meta classes okay. allow you to overload the construction of objects and classes. But not just like the construction, but like how the class is actually put together. So for example, wrapping every variable with those SQL calls that you need to make in order to create a valid database object. Ooh, that can get yeah, it gets a little hairy, but you should be could aware. Mess, that could mess things up really badly if you do it bad. Yes, that's correct. Which is why if you don't need them, you should run away. Run very, very far away. 
Um, you should also be aware of what are called magic methods. Magic methods are methods that begin with double underscore. These are basically what allows Python to talk about standard types. Like for example, the two string method is double underscore str double underscore. <coughs> um, initialization for classes is double underscore init. If you need to implement a singleton, all you have to do is override double underscore new. Um, if you want to add two methods, you override double underscore add. If you want to override um, multiplication, double underscore mul. Um, if you need to express a sequence type, all you need to do is override double underscore get item and double underscore lin to specify the length and to get a specific item. And if you have those two things, then Python knows magically how to convert that into an iterator. It's just great. So with writing a couple magic methods, you can actually achieve the same kind of idiomatic code that you get in traditional Python methods and the standard library objects. So be aware that they exist. You should probably use magic methods way more often than you do the second two things that I described. <laughs> so quick note on modules. Python has a module for just about everything or soon will. So first check the standard library. And if that doesn't quite cut it, um, Python has a collection of modules on what's called PyPy, which is the Python packaging index, not to be confused with PYPY, which is a different Python interpreter, written in Python. Um, <laughs> you can even make your own modules. This is actually a pretty easy thing to do, despite what you expect. Um, and the documentation, the best documentation that I have found for this is at that link right there. Um, there are a lot of, there's a lot of documentation on how to do it. That was the first one that I found that was actually coherent. So if you need documentation on how to develop a module, I recommend you check out that link. For the resources, there's a wonderful book called Dive into Python. There's a version for both languages. The Python standard library reference is also excellent. You should probably look in those two places first. <laughs> then, there are some PyCon talks that I want to recommend. You can find these on YouTube. One is by the guy named Raymond Hedinger. He is a maintainer for Python and developed some of the things, like for example, the name tuple class. It's very useful. He has talks that kind of talk about how to write idiomatic Python and kind of take advantage of the elegance that is Python. Um, there's also something called decorators and context managers. We very briefly talked about them. I think I had one example on a slide, but decorators and context managers are also very useful things. Uh, decorators, basically, anytime you have that at sign thing above a function, that's called a decorator. Basically, it allows you to wrap a function using the decorator pattern. Who would have guessed idiomatic names in Python? Um, there's also something called a context manager. Context managers allow you to kind of like do something with something else. Like, for example, write this with this file, write it to the file. So for example, files have context managers. SQL connections have context managers. So these allow you to have really concise code that talks about how to interact with the database and then handles all of the fancy cleaning up if the connection, say, errors out or um, does something spooky. Just be aware that context managers can really save your bacon. In Python, there is a function called help. You know how I talked about how you can kind of access those weird, spooky things about classes? Well, help actually gets what's called the docs, gets the doc string for any particular function. So if you want to know how something works, just call help on the thing and it'll give you the doc string for it. Super handy. In IPython, help is also been shortened to a question mark. So you can say thing question mark enter and it will give you the help documentation for that particular thing. Uh, for example, oop, went away. You can also do two question marks, and if it is available, it will give you the source code for that particular thing. Any questions? <laughs> well, probably later. Okay. Any questions? No. Any questions? Cool.